then I'm going to have big error by using LRAM. And again, what you're doing is you're checking in on this function uh, at, the, at the beginning of the hour now. You're checking in on this function at the beginning of the hour, and you're hoping that that's representative of what happens over the course of that entire hour. But if you have a function which is changing very rapidly, then your, then your estimation using what's happening at the beginning of the hour is going to be worse and worse. Is this, is this clear? All right. So um, if you have a big derivative, you're going to have a big error. Somehow this is related. The amount of error that you have is going to be related to the size of the derivative. All right. So now I think we're ready to like do this. Um, let's, let's suppose that we have a function. Or let's suppose that, uh, let's try to kind of, quant to kind of quantitatively uh, fix what kind of error we're going to expect. OK, suppose. Uh, that the size of the derivative, suppose we know, suppose we know that on the interval a, b, the size of the derivative is less than or equal to some constant. Let's call it k1. So k1 is just a number that I know that the derivative is going to be less than that. All right. What can I conclude from this? So this is an, this is an upper bound on the size of the derivative. And now we have to answer the question, how much error could result? How much error could result? Um, from using LRAM, from using LRAM uh, with n subintervals <coughs> to approximate some integral. So the integral, take the integral from a to b of f of x dx. I want to approximate that integral using LRAM with n subintervals, and I know that the first derivative is guaranteed to be less than or equal to k1. How much error might happen? All right, well, the thing to do here is to look at a particular subinterval. So I'm going to look at the subinterval from x sub i to x, so, sorry, from x sub i minus 1 to x to xi. So this is just, this is like the ith subinterval. Ith subinterval. And let's see how much error we get on the ith subinterval, and then. Uh, that will help us determine how much total error we get. All right, well, what might this function look like on the i subinterval? Well, suppose, well, okay, so what does LRAM do? LRAM samples from the left endpoint, right? So I'm going to plug in the left endpoint, and the only thing I know about this function is that f of x sub, that this is f of x sub i minus 1. All right, uh, okay. Well, if all I know about the function is that the derivative is less than k1, what does that tell me about this function on this interval? What could it look like? Yeah, align with, with slope k1, right? Because how much, if this function, if, if, the, if the derivative of this function is k1 at most, then what's like the worst possible function? What's the function which would create the most area? Yeah. But what's the function that would create the most error? What's the function which will be off the most the possibly? Off the most. Like if, if the slope of the function is farthest away from k1. No, if it's greatest. Yeah, so, so consider, consider what kind of functions you know, meet the requirements that they start at the point x sub i minus 1, f of x sub i minus 1, and have slope k1. Well, the biggest the function could possibly get uh, on this interval is if it just grew at the rate k1 over that entire interval. Right? So this is a function with slope equal to k1. Because if you tell me that the rate at which the function is growing is at most k1, then the biggest the function could possibly be, we did problems like this when we talked about the mean value theorem, right? If the, if the derivative, if the instantaneous rate of change is k1, 
if that's the fastest that the function can grow, then the most growth will result from the function going at that rate the entire time, right? If that's kind of like the speed limit, then you can make the most distance if you travel at that precisely that speed limit for the entire interval. Uh, and uh, it's also true that it could be negative, right? So it's also possible that my function could go at slope um, negative k1. Okay, and what do I do when I use LRAM? What I basically am doing is I'm pretending uh, I am using this black rectangle to estimate the area under the curve on this subinterval. And I don't know, from this intuitive conversation, it seems as if if, if, this, if this function represents the fastest that this function could possibly grow, and this re function represents the slowest that the function could possibly grow, where is the original function? Well, the original function is just somewhere in between. Right? I don't know where um, I don't know where the function is, but I know that if the function is growing at this rate, then it must lie somewhere between these blue lines. Right? Does that make sense, everybody? Yeah. Okay. In fact, uh, we can prove that, and uh, this is going to be some kind of a, a mean value theorem uh, conversation because the mean value theorem is sort of the theorem that tells me how much a function can grow uh, based on its derivative. So, so the mean value theorem is going to be relevant. And what we're basically going to do, so here's what I know. I know that the size of the derivative is uh, less than or equal to k1. Um, so let's suppose, let's just suppose, we're gonna, we'll just do the top case. So let's suppose that the derivative is positive. So if the derivative is positive, I'm just going to get rid of the absolute value. Uh, that, so I know that my derivative is somewhere between uh, 0 and k1, let's say. Okay. Uh, well, now I need to answer the question, how big, how big can, uh, can f of x sub i be? In other words, if I start here, how, what's the total amount by which my function could grow, assuming that that's my derivative? Well, you just apply the mean value theorem, apply the mean value theorem to f on the interval x sub i minus 1, x sub i. And the mean value theorem says that there exists some point c on that interval uh, such that the derivative at c is um, Actually, so hold on, I'm going to change one thing. Um, I'm going to apply the mean value theorem to f on the interval x sub i minus 1 x. So like let x, how about that? Let x be just some point somewhere in that interval. And what I want to say is, so if I go from the left end point to any point whatsoever, then there's some point in between such that the derivative is f of x, um, sorry. Yeah, f of x minus f x sub i minus 1 over x minus x minus 1. And uh, I also know that since the point, so c is somewhere in between here, since c is on that interval, it must be true that f prime of c is less than or equal to k1. So if the derivative is less than or equal to k1, then this f of x minus f of x sub i minus 1 over x minus 1, or x, sorry, x minus x sub i minus 1, that must be less than or equal to k1. I just proved this via the mean value theorem, and if I rearrange things, it shows that my function must be less than or equal to k1 x minus x sub i minus 1 plus f of x sub i minus 1. All right, this is a lot of like dense math here, but really it's just an application of the mean value theorem and just following the algebra. Uh, I just showed that the function must be less than that thing on the right, but that's what this function is. If you're following this, like what is this blue, what is, we're going to do this one technically, we're going to do the other ones more informally, but what is this, if I just asked you to write the equation of this blue line, like, 
that's what it is, right? It's the line uh, y equals k1 x minus x sub i minus 1 plus f of x sub i minus 1. It's just the line with slope k1 through the point this comma this. Guys, basically with me? So what I did here in the, with this mean value theorem application is I just proved rigorously that in fact my function must lie somewhere less than this blue line. And you could repeat this process to show that the function must lie somewhere above this other blue line. Okay, so when I use LRAM uh, and I know that the derivative is less than this and my function lies somewhere between, now it's time to answer the question, how much error do I have? What is the worst possible, what's the worst, what's the most amount of error I could possibly have? Keeping in mind that the, my estimate is this, uh, is the black rectangle. And the true area under the curve is the, is the, uh, the area under the red line. So what's the most error that's possible? That triangle. This triangle, right? The worst kind of function uh, is the one which increased at constant rate over that entire interval. So if my, if my function is somewhere in between the blue lines and I estimate the area under the curve to be the black rectangle, then it's the area of this green rectangle which represents the biggest possible area. Okay. And let's, uh, let's talk about this for a minute. So, okay, I know I called this, uh, let's, just, let's just temporarily call this uh, delta x, because that's just kind of easier to work with. So this is delta x. What is this, what is this height right here? Just think about that for a second. K1 x, x minus i. Yeah, if the slope of this line is k1, and this is delta x, then, you know, rise over run, this one is just k1 delta x. Okay, so this kind of concludes the argument, right? What I have now shown is that the maximum area, sorry, not maximum, the maximum error on the ith subinterval is, uh, well, it's going to be the area of that green triangle. So it's going to be one half base, which is delta x, times the height, which is k1 delta x. So that's k1 over 2 delta x squared. And then uh, of course, delta x is just shorthand for b minus a over n squared. All right. So by kind of reasoning this out and thinking about the LRAM process, uh, I know that on a single subinterval, um, LRAM might be off by this much, right? Okay, if on a single interval, LRAM is off by that much, then how much is LRAM going to be off by on the entire interval? All that times n. That times n, exactly. This is the maximum error on the ith subinterval, but then the total error, the total error is going to be that times n. So k1 over 2 times b minus a over n squared times n. Do you guys see what I just did there? I computed the error on a particular subinterval, and then I multiplied by n because that error might accumulate. Now, it's, it's very possible that um, some subintervals will have some error, but some sub the next subinterval might have an error, but the error might be in a different direction, right? One of the errors, this time it might be an overestimate, on the next subinterval it might be an underestimate. So it's possible that the errors will cancel each other out. This is like the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario, which we see in a picture like this, is that you're consistently off on each subinterval in the same direction. Right? Here, the error is, in fact, as big as it can possibly be. 
and here the error is also as big as it can possibly be. And so the sum of how much the sum of how much is off by each subinterval equals the total error. Okay. So uh, let's flip back over. Let's go back to the other board. This is our sort of like achievement for the moment. Is this formula? What does this? Uh, so let's take kind of a look at this formula for a moment and see if we can make it make sense to us. Uh, what it says is that if you're taking an integral from A to B of some function, uh, if, what? if you're taking an integral from A to B of some function, and let's temporarily call that um, I, and uh, the error, well, the, max, the maximum error, which we could also write as, thank you, which we could also write as the difference between the true area and what we got by approximating the area under the curve using LRAM with n rectangles. Is everyone okay with this? This sort of, if you translate this, this is saying basically the same thing, the error, this is the error. The difference between the true area and the L RAM approximation area, what we have just showed is that this is less than or equal to uh, K1 over 2 B minus A squared over N. Guys with me? Okay, some observations about this formula. Can someone say something interesting about this formula? Mary, the hand. What's something about the yeah, Peter? Um, Daniel. Um, so you need k one to find that. You have to find the maximum. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but like, so how does this formula? How does the error change as the various pieces of this formula change? I mean, one kind of obvious observation, maybe you just think it's too obvious to mention, which is that the bigger k one is, the more error, right? So, okay, so that's, that's kind of all I'm looking for, right? The bigger K1, uh, the bigger the error is going to be. So, and that kind of makes sense, right? Because that's, that's the picture we drew like 20 minutes ago. If, this, if the derivative is really, really big, what's up? Do you have paper plates? Uh, yeah, well, can you just get them from the magnet office? Um, the, bigger, the bigger K1 is, then the bigger the error is going to be. What else? How much? The bigger the interval, the bigger the error. The bigger the interval, the bigger error, right? So, so if you have a bigger, if you have a bigger interval, I mean, if you just look at the formula, um, the bigger b minus a is, the bigger the error is. In fact, the error is going to go quadratically with b minus a. Why does that make sense? That the longer the interval, the more error. Yeah, of course, because if you're accumulating a certain amount of error on every subinterval, then if you go out really, really far, then the error is going to just keep accumulating and accumulating. Okay, so the bigger the interval, the bigger the error. And then finally, the more rectangle, the smaller error. Yeah, uh, the, the bigger n is, the smaller the area. The smaller the error is. Bigger n is, uh, the smaller the error is. I keep saying the smaller the error, but I really don't mean that because I don't actually know what the error is. In fact, I never know what the error is, right? I never actually ever figure out what the error is. I simply estimate, I simply tell you how big the error could be at most. Right, that's kind of how we treat error. Okay, um, so yeah. Uh, and another thing to mention, not only is the bigger n is the smaller error, but in fact it goes to zero, right? The error goes to zero uh, as n goes to infinity. Error goes to zero as n goes to infinity. Although not very quickly, right? Just linearly goes to infinity. Okay, now an example. How can you actually use this? Take some function. Let's take the integral from 1 to 6 of 2 sine 3x dx. Okay, we're going to use this as a nice, nice example, even though, I mean, 
what's sort of an obvious statement to make about this integral? Uh, we can do it, right? I mean, we actually could do this. I don't need to estimate this. Unlike some of the examples that we've been working on last class and this class, I could just use this, I could just do this using the fundamental theorem of calculus. But I'm choosing this as an example because it's kind of a nice one. Um, Eli is graphing the function, but I'd like to go on just the interval. Can we go? Can we look at it just from like zero to six or like zero to seven or something? Go like zero to seven. That seems like good. zero to seven. Okay, here it is. Beautiful function. I want to know what the integral is. First, let's like cheat and um, calculate it. What's the true answer? Can you math nine? No, quick, quick, quick. Yeah, math nine. You put it in y1, I assume? Oh, uh, yeah. No, bars. Bars, y, bars, y1. Ah, I always do that. X, comma, uh, 1 to 6. OK, so by cheating, we know that the answer is negative 1.100, you know, 2, blah, blah, blah. OK, so our goal is to use LRAM or RAM to get an estimate for this and then to tell me how good the estimate is. All right, so let's do this now. Um, you just go. Find L31 uh, and a bound on the error. Do it. So your diagram doesn't have to be like accurate or anything, but I think it is worth like making some kind of diagram just to help you like think. <coughs> or you can do the whole thing in your head, but I don't recommend that. All right, what's what's delta x? How much do I skip by each time? Yeah, so this is kind of a weird one, right? If I do delta x is now going to be you know b minus a over 31. So I'm skipping by 531 each time, right? Okay, so then you can kind of make a picture of this situation. So this point will be like 1 plus delta x. And this is like 1 plus 2 times delta x, right? And then how about that second to last one? Uh, yep. That's 30 delta x. And then that last one will be 1 plus. 31 delta x. And since delta x is 5 over 31, that's going to be 6, so it's all making sense. So you have kind of like a picture.
that's not like a real picture. That's just like a that's just like a sort of a picture of a generic function because I'm gonna type it into my calculator anyway. So my graph doesn't have to be accurate. You can see what I mean by that. I'm just like drawing like just generic function. So so then someone do this. Like what is the summation that I'm gonna get? Sigma from i equals to zero. This is what we did last class. It makes more sense to start from zero and end at 30. And then what's the width of each subinterval? 5 over 31. And then what's the height of the ith rectangle? i times 5i over i times x. Yeah. f of 5i I f of one plus I f of one plus five i over thirty one. Five over thirty one i. Yeah. I think that's right, right? Yeah. That's sum of thirty one rectangles starting at zero, going to thirty. Each one is going to be determined by this formula. So you just have to like check that it works, right? When i is zero, then I get f of one, which is what I wanted. You know, when i is one, I get the next one, all the way up to the last one is the thirtieth rectangle. Uh, and that is the that is what I want, right? Because that last one is going to be one plus thirty delta x. Is this not making sense? Okay, then you just do it. Do you doing it? Do you want me to do this? This is what we practiced last class. Um, so in order for this, you we we want to do you know we do five over thirty one times list math sum of the sequence which is determined by, you put the correct thing in y run, right? Yeah. Sum of the sequence, which is determined by v, um, y1 of 1 plus, and then it's like 5 over 31x. Yeah. Uh, close the function, comma x, comma 0, uh, oh, zero comma 30. Three. Close the sequence, close the sum. So that's just our way of making the calculator do sigma notation for us, and we end up with that number. I think that's right. Can someone, did someone else get that? Yeah. Okay, if you didn't get that, you're doing something wrong. All right, so what we have just concluded is that L of 31 is negative 0.93, you know, 47, you know, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so but that's kind of like what we already did last class. What I'm interested now is I'm not, like, like I was just saying before, um, just telling me that the integral is about this is meaningless. What I want to know now is how much error did I produce at most? I'm pretty sure that's right. Is at least one other person getting what I got? I got it. T did? Okay. Um, all right, cool. Um, okay, so how much could the error be? Well, what is the error? What is going to be the error produced on um, the difference between the true integral and this? This is going to be, uh, so it's k1 over 2, uh, b minus a squared over n. So what is k1, by the way? Is it the slope of the secant line? The max derivative on this interval. So that sounds like something we need to do, right? What is the max derivative on this interval? <coughs> okay, we just have to compute the derivative, right? Uh, if this function is 2 sine 3x, you know, what's the derivative? Six, yeah, it's 6 cosine 3x. So in fact, the derivative is always going to be uh, for any, it's always going to be between negative 6 and 6. So it's just true that the size of the first derivative is less than or equal to 6. Someone see what I just did there? I mean, I found, I found an upper bound. That number, k1, is a number that you have to figure out based on knowing the function. So since this derivative is always less than or equal to 6, it's certainly true that the derivative is less than or equal to 6 on the interval 1 to 6, right? So I can show that this error is going to be less than 6 over 2 times uh, 25, over 25 over 31. Can you compute that? 75 
75 over 31. I think, right? Wait, 75. Uh, the 25. Oh, yeah. Which is 2.419. Okay. So this is not very good, right? What this tells me, what I can now report is that, uh, is that the integral is, I think the integral is guaranteed to be negative 0.9347 plus or minus 2.419. That is a true statement, right? I've narrowed down the integral to being, I'm off by at most like 2.419. Um, can anyone explain why it appears that my, that, my, that my approximation is actually quite good when my error thinks that I might be off by a lot, but I'm actually not off by a lot? Is that just luck? Danny. Yeah, because, because this particular function is sinusoidal, even though its derivative is like 6 and later on its derivative is like negative 6, um, in our, the formula assumes that the derivative might be like, or that the function might be increasing at the rate 6 like the entire time. Right? So this is one of those cases in which the error produced on each subinterval, they're kind of canceling each other out, right? Um, on all the different subintervals, you're going to have some positive error and some negative error, and they happen to give me a pretty good estimate, but this is all I can guarantee the estimate gives me. Okay, um, now uh, something maybe a little bit more, even more relevant. Um, uh, and okay, so by the way, how can we do better with this? A more rectangle. Um, yeah, one way that we could do better is uh, more rectangles. Um, but before we get to that, uh, how about this kind of question? How many rectangles are needed? How many rectangles are needed? Yeah, so, so that I'm off by at most 0.01 to be accurate uh, to, or to be accurate to, you know, uh, the, yeah, to two decimal places. So we're taking this particular function on this particular interval, in particular using LRAM, and now this error bound formula kind of lets me work backwards, and if someone demands for some kind of particular reason that I be accurate up to a certain point, I know how many rectangles I need. Do you guys understand the question? Yeah. I want to know um, when is the max error, which we can think of as the difference between the true area and the area as estimated using n rectangles, when is that going to be less than or equal to 0.01. Yeah, so we kind of just do it, right? Um, I want to know, so k1 is 6, and b minus a squared is 25, and n is, I don't know, when is that going to be 